Hey everyone, just quick announcement before I share today's episode with John Santanu. John has an amazing story and excited for him to get to share that with you guys. But just want to take a minute to share the release of my first children's book of my Healthy Children's Book series called Maddox's Trip to the Chiropractor. It's a cute book with bright pictures that follows a toddler on her trip to the chiropractor. It shows her excitement and how she knows that it impacts her health in a positive way. And each purchase of the book will be supporting a project that I started called the Unlock Wellness Project. For each purchase of the book, we will be donating a wellness bag to a child in need. These wellness bags will include non-toxic, chemical-free essentials such as soap, shampoo, toothpaste, a toothbrush, items that a lot of the time children in tough situations don't have access to. You can learn more about the book and about the Unlock Wellness Project by going to drcaseyjohnson.com. That's D-R-K-A-S-E-Y johnson.com. Click on the shop tab and click the children's book option. You'll be able to read a short description and even watch a short video with more information. You can also purchase the book directly on amazon.com by searching Maddox's trip to the chiropractor. But I hope you guys love the book. Be sure to check out my website to learn more and thank you so much for the support. Now it's time for today's episode. I hope you love my conversation with John Santanu. Welcome to the Unlock Wellness Podcast. I'm Dr. Casey and excited for today's guest. I'm here with John Santanu. And John is a world-renowned basketball coach, motivator, and author who went from leading the nation and scoring as a college athlete to coaching top programs in high school, college, and the pros. And I'm excited for John to share his story with you guys and just hope it inspires you to push harder towards your goals than ever before. So John, just thank you so much for taking time to come on. I'm excited to have you. Well, I'm excited to be here. It's wonderful to be a guest on your show. I'm, I'm, I'm very excited and hope I can help all the listeners. Definitely. Yeah. And so let's just kind of jump into your backstory. So kind of walk us through, you know, what life looked like as that young kid playing basketball in Tucson and then just how that's kind of led you to where you are right now, just along your journey. Well, you know, way back then, you know, when I was coming up as a player, it was, uh, not not many distractions, you know, not many channels on television and, uh, you know, video games hadn't become... No, uh, no Facebook, no Facebook. Had, <laughs> no, 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 no social media. None of those things had come around yet. So playing basketball was, was an outlet and something that I did and uh, just needed to get outside and I uh, fell in love with it. It was a passion and it was something that I could do uh, on my own and I didn't need, you know, anyone else. You just need a ball and, and a hoop and and you could just practice as much as you wanted to. So you did. You grew up in Tucson, right? So how, like, how were the basketball programs there? Did you jump in right away with a team, or did you kind of just more like with your friends, and then it yeah. just eventually into like high school and, and stuff? Well, so yeah. So eventually, what it, what happened is was it was an outdoor playground style and just playing that way. And then you know I started at a at an elementary school called St. John's Elementary and had a very very instrumental coach in, in my path there. He, he was calm and a teacher of the game. And, and that's how I first began my, my journey. The passion was just, it was always there, but I just didn't know where I would lead me to. Um, fortunately, you know, I, I, I ended up playing pretty well and I ended up going to a private high school uh, called South Point Catholic. And again, you know, just, just, keeping my head down and trying to be the best that I possibly could be along the way. And I had no idea what would happen after that. Um, you know, I just, I didn't know anything else because no one in my family had gone to college. So we, we didn't, we didn't know what that next journey was going to be. Yes. Was college even on the radar? Like at that point, or were you just like, just thinking of it as something to do that you loved during high school or were you, was like college kind of in the back of your mind? Oh, it, it was clearly in my mind. I mean, at the time I'm watching Larry Bird and Magic Johnson play and, you know, so NBC would put on a game of the week and it was just spectacular. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so my, my, my passion was to watch these players play and I had visions of me being there one day, but, you know, here's this kid from South side of Tucson uh, you know, first of all, and uh, I, I suppose what really truly opened my eyes is as a as a junior going into my senior year, I get an invitation to go to the prestigious five star camp in in Pittsburgh, and 
there I get the opportunity to see the best players in, in the, in all of the country. And now I'm truly getting to see w- where I thought I was good. And now seeing the people all over the, all over in different cities and everywhere else and how good they are. Uh, it really opened my eyes and I came back feeling that I could play with them, but I needed to work much, much harder. Right. So it is kind of like, I mean, yeah, like you were saying, it's cool because you get to see what's out there because you kind of have like when you're in that small bubble of people that you're maybe playing better than, but you don't realize like every town has amazing people. So then you, then you get them all together, really just, you know, just a whole different perspective. Yeah. The, the, the amount of talent, I mean, I was playing against Dwayne, the Pearl Washington who ended up having a brilliant career at Syracuse, uh, uh, Muggsy Bogues, uh, unbelievable talent at, at Baltimore Dunbar high school. These, these were the guys I was competing against. And and I could just see like, wow, you know, my athleticism was nowhere near what they had. But what I could count on was that I could shoot the basketball. And so I tried to work as, as, as many different angles that I could. Now, you got to keep in mind, you know, this is 1982, 83 year. And there's no, there's no such thing as personal trainers and, right. and trying to get better that way. This was individually you had to be driven to try to do this stuff on your own or with your respective teams that you were playing with. And, uh, and so I couldn't afford being on a, on an AAU team, even though it was in, it's barely in its inception back then. I, mm-hmm. I just couldn't do that. So what I did was the best I knew how, you know, you found inspiration from older people. And so there were older college guys that, that, took me by the hand a gentleman by the name of Virgil Banks had played college basketball and he would take me places to play uh, another guy named Gerald Reese who played in Iowa and led the country in scoring he took me under his wing and I, I got to see what it was what it was like to work re- religiously every day with with these higher level athletes just really trying to beat me all the time and uh, you know they weren't taking it easy and that was <laughs> perhaps the best thing that ever happened to me at Definitely. that time in my career. Yeah. And that's, I mean, I love, and you brought that point, like you don't have trainers, obviously there's not, you can't just Google basketball workouts or like, <laughs> that's a whole different, that's a whole different like world. So like, so, I mean, that's awesome that you had those mentors to kind of like work with you and like, let you know, like what you needed to do to reach that next level. And so like at that point, did you have a college in mind to where you wanted to go or did people start to reach out to you like later in high school? Yeah. You know, so I, I, I had my high school coach and then I just kept telling him that I definitely wanted to play college basketball, but I had no, I had no idea what college was all anything going to be like in my own hometown. There was one and it's university of Arizona. And, you know, it was just, I was not really on their radar and applications and things just went out to different people. And I, lo and behold, I get a call from University of California at Santa Cruz, a coach there just persistently and consistently kept calling. And so that's how the relationship was built. I, I went to that school. I applied. I got in. Uh, thankfully, my, my academic grades were, were, were great, were good to, to get into to the UC system. Um, but I went to the school site unseen. I never, I never took a visit. This, this was all kind of, uh, new for me. I had taken a visit to Idaho, um, in like, uh, like I think it was the, the time of the final four and, you know, I slipped on ice. It was my first time <laughs> in that kind of weather. It was wonderful, but it just wasn't there was just something that just wasn't the same, you know? And so it's, yeah. it's, it's a relationship business. And thankfully, uh, coach Joe Richardson kept the conversation piece going with me. And, and I arrived on campus. Like I said, I, I had never seen it before. Uh, I had only seen the, the pictures that they sent in a brochure. Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, like it, cause he has, he's, I mean, he kept close contact and it felt more like friends and family. So it was, I'm sure that was just, more comforting that you were going to a place where you knew like you were going to have like that kind of attention. Well, you know, you just, you just, 
it, it's like anything else. You want to go where you're wanted. You know, right. it's, it's, at some point there's, there is something where you're going to have an academic problem at some point in your c- collegiate career. Uh, you're just not going to do well in some class and you're going to have a, a, a personal, personal problem, you know, where you're socially, you may not get along with a roommate or so on. And then a- a- athletically as well, you one day the ball just isn't going to go in. So at that point, you know, you want it to be with, with those that have really wanted you so that they don't discard you and go after new recruits, which right. is part of the business. But, you know, during your tenure, while you're there, you know, you want to be made to feel like, like they wanted you and they believe in you and it's time to, to do what you're, what you're there to do. Right. So once you get to, um, you know, you get to California, like how was that transition period for you? Like when starting basketball, like was, did you excel that first season or did it take a little time just to build as a team? No, I, I, I came in ready, you know, like I was prepared really well. And so I came in um, with no expectations to, to play or to even start, but, but I was given the opportunity to, to do both. And, um, and then, you know, in high school, I only averaged, I think, 14 or 16, 16 points a game, I believe. Mm-hmm. And as I played for a gentleman that was, that was strict as to making sure that a good shot versus a great shot and that when I did take it, you know, it was expected that I make it. And so it was demanding. And in, co- in hindsight, when I went to college then, that first year, I averaged 20 points a game. And, awesome. and my coaches were just saying, you know, you need to shoot more. Yeah. You know, they were, they were encouraging me to do more, but, but I came from a system where I, I can't, you know, I cannot just shoot the ball, you know? And so it took, took some time to adjust, to learn, to, to, to be able to give, be given the green light and shoot the ball with, with more ease and don't worry about misses. Definitely. No, that's extremely important. Um, yeah. So like, you know, you said you started off 20 points and that's your freshman season. And, you know, I know with one of your, you know, it's, it's, it's amazing. Like you had the most points in the NCAA. For, it was that, what season yeah. was that? So that, that first year is 20. The second year I go to 25. And then my junior season, uh, I leapfrog to 31 points a game. Wow. And I'm, I'm now cultivating these relationships all along the way because at the time as a college student, I wanted to become a camp counselor. You know, so Coach John Wooden, Jamal Wilkes, Pat Riley, uh, anybody like that that had a basketball camp, uh, I wanted to be with because it was one a way to to live a, away on a on a college campus um, to learn from the best and teach a little bit, but also to play against other co- other other players mm-hmm. in college. So. There was one gentleman by the name of Luther Witsit who took me under his wing and his two sons play college basketball at Stanford. And he was instrumental because what he changed for me was not just the way I was shooting, but he gave me discipline in terms of like, it's not, we're just not going to make baskets. We're going to make baskets all net. You're not going to hit the rim. And that took a, an intense focus. And with that, led me to to work out religiously with with him and his family at 5:30 every morning <laughs> and it was it was brilliant because while we focused on concentrating on the game of basketball at that at that level of focus there was the other side of doing other things aside from that you know talking intelligently about a book um, other, other aspects to widen your range of who you are as a college athlete. Um, and it was, it was remarkable because that, that year that I went and led the country in scoring was really because I was training totally different than others were at that time. And your mindset's at a different level as well, because you're, you're growing as a person as well. I, I was so, I was learning about trajectory and things that are now the, the sport and science of common probably in today's game is common. And it wasn't common back then. Mm-hmm. And I wanted to learn about, about the science of making it all net. So then when I did get into a game, if I hit the rim, hey, you know, 
two basketballs fit in the basket. You know, you're always heard that, but when you really see it, it's, <laughs> you got to take the rim down and bring it to your eye level. And then you can really see what that, what that really means. And um, so it was, it was, it was great. Cause I was just becoming a, a, a sharpshooter. And then I just needed to work as hard as I could as terms of if I could get a shot off, I had a great, sh a great shot at making it. Um, so then I needed to be as best I could at getting free. <laughs> so right. I had to learn all those other things then. How did having like that record, like, I, I mean, I'm sure you had a lot of like media attention from that. I mean, did that just really like reinforce your levels of just where you wanted to take your game as far as like to the next level, like professionally, like how was getting all of that media attention? Like how did that affect you? And, and kind of walk me through that a little bit. I'm telling you, you know, it's it's a strange environment at the time because they're this is the beginning of ESPN at the time, and so we're not really sure what that's like. If you if you go back and you look at what ESPN was all about back then, it was really regional, almost like people would send in clips from wherever they were or across the country, right? And uh, and then they would broadcast it from Bristol. And it looked really, really awkward. So one day ESPN came in to do an interview on me and then it was, I have no idea who they are. You know, we just don't know. Right. It's not the same as like if I, and if the ESPN anchors now, to a high school now, like, you know, that's a huge deal. I mean, it's a huge deal then, but you just don't, yeah, you're not aware of that at, th at that time. Yeah. I just wasn't aware of it. I had no, really no concept of what it was like and was being, and, and, and I'm also cognizant of my teammates, you know, when there's a, so much attention focused on you, you know, I, I really wanted, I just didn't want like a mutiny of my teammates to not understand like how important their rebound was or their screens are for me to get a shot off. It's, it's one thing for a coach to, to, to designate and design plays to help you win. It's another for your teammates to understand like, uh, yes, I'm going to get, the majority of the points, but let me tell you, without these screens and without this and that, I have right. nothing. You you're know, not doing so. it. Yeah, you're not doing it alone. So I was really trying to make that point come across because all during this time, I'm I'm having wonderful discussions with Coach John Wooden. You know, I, I had been working with him. I got the opportunity to go to his house on a on a regular awesome. and consistent basis, and so his advice to me you know, was invaluable because it was about not losing the sight of your teammates. Yes, I was gifted in terms of putting the ball in the basket and, and, but, you know, but I was only one. I couldn't take the ball out and I couldn't pass it to myself and these other key factors that needed to be taught to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So how did like, cause you were there your, to your junior year and then, uh, you know, how was your senior year? And then where did you kind of go post-college like how did that evolve yeah so so what evolved was there was a there, we had a coaching change my junior season and even though I led the country in scoring under this new coach we just didn't we didn't mesh together because I I, I felt that we could do more in terms of winning games and going and securing more athletes to 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 better ourselves. You know, I, I just felt that it was just me scoring all the time. And, and so we, we had a falling out and, uh, I ended up going to the university of California at San Diego. It was still within the UC system. So I stayed within the, the same university of California educational system. The city was larger. The university was larger. The market was bigger. And, uh, and again, I had known that coach because I had seen him year after year and he had always opened his door to me saying, you know, if I had ever wanted to transfer, you know, mm -hmm. mainly joking, but <laughs> in this particular case, it became reality and it came to fruition. And so I did go, um, but I surrendered my entire scoring, uh, because on that team, were two already established scores and I'm coming in to play one season. And, um, and the role was yes, for me to score as well, but you know, when there's how, two other people doing it, it's just not, 
you know, not the it same. It wasn't, yeah, it's not required of me to get 30 points a game. It's, right. It would be nice if, because I, now I, I, I took the role, I completely changed. I gave up that scoring uh, mentality to go into a point guard role um, and distribute and score at the same time, which eventually helped my career out immensely because right. I now became a lot more diverse and, and fit, fit in with the team. And, uh, you know, we worked out, we worked out all the, all the things because I think they wanted to know, was I going to just come in and be selfish and shoot or was I going to be a team player? Right. Right. And how did, where did you go post-college? Like how did that, cause I know, I mean, you've had, a, I mean, an extremely impressive, you know, post playing career, but did you, did you play professionally at all? You know? Oh yeah. College. Yeah. So again, by, by leading the country in scoring back uh, at this point in time, there are no, there are no, uh, there is no internet. So people could get that information the way they can get it now. You know, you could just Google things. Um, back then there was, Marty Blake was a scout and some others. And so people would just pick up the NCAA live, whatever, whatever could be po posted by NCAA. And that was mainly through sports information directors sending it out. Well, by me leading the country in scoring helped because it was Reggie Miller, uh, Lenny Bias and guys like that, that I'm, that I'm, you know, in, in the, in the hunt to at that time of year. And, um, so my post career, it was because of that on my resume that said, this is the nation's leading score. Uh, I got an opportunity to play in Europe, uh, right away. And it was, it was mainly because of that, because I was not, you know, I'm not six foot eight and, you know, and I didn't play at uh, UCLA, uh, but my numbers of production, um, were something that people took took notice of and so it really helped me right and how was how was playing overseas because you know you always you know kind of like paint a picture for us of what that's like for a player just you know to go to europe and to play basketball professionally like what does that all look like as an athlete okay well you know for each athlete there's a different story on that so uh, i'll give you a, a bird's eye view of what it was like <laughs> going to a place or you, you're not sure of, you know, so obviously a foreign language in a foreign country with traditions and customs. Mm -hmm. uh, sure. It's kind of scary. Yeah. So you're, you're on your own. And um, so when you, when you arrive, it's the same thing, just like anywhere else, there's a, an energy and excitement about being with a new team and then how to fit in. Uh, but then you're on your own, you know, you are after practice, that's it. You know, you, you go back to your residence, whether that's a hotel or a, or a house or wherever, an apartment, wherever they have you at. And that downtime is all yours. So in the eighties, there's, there's no laptop, there's no cell phones, you know, uh, by me call, calling back to my house was collect calls and those were extremely expensive. Right. So <laughs> it was about saying hello, a couple words, and then that was it. Yeah. So you, you wrote letters and if you could catch something on television, it was local and you couldn't understand it. <laughs> you, were, you were rare if you could find it on another, some, so, some sort of other channel. And so everything was on your own. So there's a lot of growth in terms of going to a restaurant on your own. And, and then that's, that's beyond playing. So that's, that's where players really had tough times because, you know, well, what are they going to do? <laughs> so you had to, you have to learn how to read books or write letters or, or something, you know, so you sightsee throughout the city, you do other things. Um, but then when it was time to, to go to practice, you gave it your all and you played in front of large audiences that love the game. And you were uh, a hero or a villain, you know, depending <laughs> on about where you played at. Yeah. And, um, and then you made the most out of the situation as um, as a basketball program though like i mean is uh, like how was like the actual playing experience part for you like i i mean as far as like 
organization of leagues and like just how everything was set up? Like, was it ran like, like, like you expected it to or better or worse or like how was that all of that? Well, you know, there's, there's a, there's the, the added caveat now of salary. And Mm -hmm. so some teams didn't meet payroll all the time. And I was on some of those teams that didn't meet payroll on a regular basis. Um, So that's something you have to decide for yourself, whether you're going to wait it out and trust and play and, or, or you decide you're going to leave, you know, and to leave to what is the next question. You know, this is pretty standard. You know, you get a round trip airline ticket, hotel, maybe your meals may be covered. And then whatever you're, agreed upon salary is twice a month. That's pretty much standard professional contract around the world. Um, But you know, when you're there at the time that I was, there were not many, not many leagues around the world. There are now, you know, because it's become a global, uh, you know, so by me playing in Spain, there was only one. There are now six levels of basketball (laughs) in Spain. I know it's, it's growing like crazy. Let me ask you just your opinion, John, like, um, uh, just because you know we're hearing a lot about like all all of the things going on with like you know Lavar Ball yeah. and stuff and like you know that's bringing a lot of attention to overseas basketball. Like I, I mean, just being somebody that is right. really knowledgeable about about basketball and about being overseas. Like you know, <laughs> what's your opinion on that? Because there's a whole lot of opinions going on right now. Yeah, well, I, that's a tough a tough thing to do. You know, I um. I'm I'm a parent also, so it's a little yeah. tough for me to to explain what Lavar is doing with his children, especially the both of those children. You know the the consequences there there are there are consequences for your actions. And what he did in China, I, I was in China several times. Mm-hmm. Um, you know the, the the child stole and and should pay the consequences. Oh, for definitely, that. definitely. And um, and. And the same, you know, by trying to control a high school coach as well. So there are a lot of things that LaVar has done that have damaged from an outsider's perspective, like myself as a coach, a player, and as a parent, that you're interfering. And now using marketing and everything, yeah, okay. So there's some, there's some things that he's constantly in the news about. Lithuania is a basketball crazed country. Now I've not, I've not been there, but I've been around the area, but it is, it is uh, basketball crazed. The kids are going to experience, you know, a wide open system and, and criticism because when things go right, yeah, they love you, but when things go wrong, you know, the outside, the foreigner is the first to blame. Right. And in that case, both of those kids haven't been used to any of the criticism that comes mm-hmm. and, and for their consequences for their actions. Now they're, they're living in a, not even in the city, they're living further away. And so it's almost like fantasy land. They're not in the, they're not in the true professional experience that that team would probably have them staying at. Yeah. So I don't, I don't think it was right to, to jeopardize the young man's both of their careers. Um, because they gave up their amateur status. Right. And, uh, Cause I mean, that's, I mean, it's a pretty, you know, I mean, it's going to be a hard journey, right? I mean, to get from that position to, you know, what they're trying to accomplish of getting from overseas to, you know, getting them both in the Lakers. I mean, like that is, I, yeah. I mean, super far fetched, but I mean, Hey, if it works, it works and, you know, good for them. And, but I mean, I mean, how often do you see that? I mean, like, I don't know. I mean, I feel like it's really hard to get from that position all the way way back up to, to NBA status. (laughs) It's going to be a long, (laughs) rough journey. You know, first of all, let's just take into consideration, you know, all the analysts that that look at the game and, you know, Angela was not at the top of, of anybody's radar in that, in that respect. I feel like, yeah, I feel like Mello's had more of a status than, than the, than uh, the middle. Yeah, and, and Lamelo certainly has, but in but in a high school setting with no playing of right. any defense whatsoever, and being able to cast a shot however he wishes, sure, that is totally going to have changed at an at a respective university. 
but that now remains to be seen. Now to force his way on, like like Lavar's not making any friends lately by criticizing <laughs> Luke Walton right. and uh, and others. So again, it's it's about going after others and not the ones responsible. You know, it's you know, Coach Wooden told me in the boldest of ways. You know, it was it was up to me to put the ball in the basket. And it was up to me to stop the other person from scoring. And, you know, that I never forgot that. Mm-hmm. A coach could draw up plays and make you run around in circles and try to tell you to stop things, but it's still this that simple of a game. Right. And we 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 love to criticize everybody on the outside, but you know, it really will be about the production of of the of the respective kids and those those two kids have gone now got an uphill battle. You know, they are <laughs> out of do. school now and mm-hmm. and they're in a they're in a cold environment right now. So we'll see how they do. I mean Yeah, we'll see. We'll see. It's um it's one of those things, you know, you, you hope the best and it would definitely be an interesting thing to watch and hopefully they can pull it off. You know, I definitely always hope the best, but um, if, but yeah, if it's, it's a the- circus, they're going to do great. If it's not a circus, <laughs> they're going to struggle. Oh man. All right. Sorry. I, sorry. We got off topic there, but I wanted to hear your opinion on that, but, uh, but we'll jump back in and, and what did your, to kind of walk us through from, you know, going from your, your career overseas to, yeah. you know, I know you started to get more into coaching. So yeah, kind of walk us into your post player, career and how that's and how that's evolved as well yeah so quickly once i finished playing professional basketball then i came back to uh decide what i would do next in life and ended up being a high school basketball coach and uh found that it was uh, thoroughly enjoying and and trying to teach young young kids how to play and you never you're never quite sure as an athlete if you can transfer your knowledge to someone else um and, and even when they look at you and they're telling you, you know, you put the ball in the basket, you know, t- teach me how to do this exact same thing. So you're never quite sure. Mm-hmm. Luckily, I, I was fortunate enough to have some great high school teams here in Southern California, San Diego area where I began. And, and then that led me to go into, into another state back, back to Tucson, Arizona for a few years there. And then I, get a call one day to go into the Pac-10 conference, which is now the Pac-12 conference, uh, with, with the coach that um, had been my freshman high school coach. And it was, that was uh, the beginning of a, a whole new adventure there because now it was, instead of high school now, it's, it's college, it's, it's winning, and, uh, you know, it's criticism and critique like you wouldn't believe. And, yeah, and that was Oregon State, right? And that's at Oregon State. Okay. And then, uh, and then after my tenure at Oregon State, then I become a professional head coach, and I go to a couple different countries, and and that has allowed me then to to speak in a multitude of different places and and share my knowledge in basketball as I've gotten to know people from about twenty eight different countries, I believe. No, that's awesome. And do you have like? I mean, I know you. I'm sure you love coaching at all levels, but is there a certain level that you? really really love or is it pretty equal across the board well they're all they're all different there's some that are fantastic right so there's you know like the like the high school student you could see those results tangibly working in your favor right away you could see Mm -hmm. things you can see an evolution of a kid and 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 the growth and the confidence building you could just see that the college kid, this is all about like just totally competition amongst each other. And there's, right, because they're trying to get to that next level. Right, they are. And there's, there's, a, a, there's an inherent jealousy that's, in, that's inbred with that because everyone needs playing time and minutes. Mm-hmm. And so there's daily competition with each other. The professional level is all the money driven, you know, and you're hoping that you can get an athlete to – to buy into other things because unfortunately for those guys, they've been taught like they're, they've been treated like they're like they're cattle a little bit. Like they're supposed right. to, I, you know, I pay you, you should put in 20 points and we should, that should be automatic. And that's not the case. So sometimes they've lost the passion. So there's a fine line between all three of those levels, you know, and the, 
again, the, the most rewarding where it's probably still a little bit um, uh, wholesome is still at the high school level. Although, although parents now have really joined in on the, on the, the brigade to get a college scholarship and dictate what happens there. Right. Right. I mean, yeah, I mean, there's definitely, I mean, I can't imagine being a, a coach, especially at a high level. <laughs> I mean, you know, you're, especially when you know you're trying to help all of these athletes and you know, it's their future. And I'm like, you know, it's, I'm, I'm just sure it has to be extremely hard, but like you said, extremely rewarding as well. Yeah, it, 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 it is, you know, but you have to, you have to have some, sense and sensibility around it. There are only five players that get to play. Sometimes those teams only carry 13 to 15 athletes only. Um, boy, you know, when you have to cut somebody, it's a miserable time. Oh, I'm sure. I'm sure. Yeah. yeah. That's sign of a good coach. I, in my opinion is one that maybe has cut somebody and sits back and reevaluates and maybe allows that, that player to come and try again something like that. Sometimes there's, there's just mistakes that are made and maybe you just didn't see the right thing at the right time. Uh, that's, that's the, that's the difficulty in the profession, but you know, there's criticism follows no matter what, you know, everyone wants to win and they don't see behind the scenes, right. The preparation that goes into it from not only the player, but the, the coaching staff as well. Everybody needs to prepare to, to win those, to win at any game at any sure. level. Yeah. I mean, and, and not just physically, John, you know, mentally as well. And that's something yeah. that most people don't um, take into account. I like the pressure that these athletes and these coaches have. And like, I mean, <laughs> I mean, like, cause a lot is riding on them or on the coaches. And so it's not just physical preparation, but, but mental preparation too, which is, which is awesome when you hear of coaches, like yourself that really help with that aspect because it's um, I mean, I mean, I'm sure you could argue like that it's more of a mental game than, than physical. Oh, you know, once you get through the sure, you know, there, there's been psychological studies even done on, on uh, Olympic athletes, mm -hmm. you know, uh, the sprinters, for example, they don't, they can't be sprinting all the time during the Olympics for their events, you know, so they, they psychologically run through that memory of visualization of running their race and their, their muscles twitch the exact same way. Yeah. It's you know, amazing. It's, a, it's an amazing process, you know, cause you, you, you can't run them to death, you know? No, for sure. For sure. And, and I know you, I mean, you were just talking about, you know, you, you, where you were coaching, you were coaching overseas and then you were coaching in a few different places. And yeah. I think I was reading too, you were on the warrior staff as well for, a year or so, right? Yeah, currently with the uh, Clippers doing um, doing scouting uh, on assignment from time to time, you know. So cool. I've been to uh, I've been to Poland. I've done some guest speaking in Mexico. I've scouted some players here in at University of Arizona and, and elsewhere. And uh, you know, it just it's based upon uh, experience of being somewhere and seeing what that player and that level is like. The NBA is totally different though. You know, it's not like a selection process where somebody could just offer someone a contract. There, there are two rounds of draft picks. So the right. very elite, you know, you just, you just are hoping whatever, whatever you fall in order. If you're the first round draft pick, okay, you got, you got lots, lots of choices, you know. So that's why there are scouts all over the world because they're, they're just making opinions on who they've seen. And then each NBA team gathers all that information. They put it into what's called the war room and they have it uh, position wise, something like 60, 60 positions per so they can decide, you know, where they are along the board mm -hmm. uh, when that time comes in June. Um, and then you're, then you then you can play with free agency and other things, but realistically, who makes that team? It's each year it's one player for sure is drafted, and that player gets signed. The others are not guaranteed. It's just you could be picked, but that doesn't mean you're signed. Right, and then and then from there, either gone or um, I guess it's called yeah. I guess it's G League now, right? So right. So either one of one of those options. So so basically, with with your job right now, I mean, you're doing a lot of traveling, I guess, and just you know scouting all all these players and just kind of re 
reporting back to the Clippers and let them know what you see. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. That's it. You know, I go and like, for example, when I went to university of Arizona, it was to, uh, for me not to see, you know, who, who's the best on the team. You mm-hmm. know, you've already have a preconceived notion of who that's going to be. I just want to let it, let it be seen to me blind. So obviously there's the seven footer Deandre Aton who's just unbelievable right. size, body, talent, skill level, and oh, just yeah. stands out, you know, and it's, and it's the intangible. So now I'm, I'm paying attention to things that are matter to me, you know, how, how, how he handles substitution, you know, when he has to be cut, cut out, how he handles criticism. Are they constantly praising him? You know, there's, there's a lot of other factors that go on besides just can the kid put the ball in the basket and dunk it. Yeah. And, that's, uh, that's super interesting. So, so you're looking at a lot of, I mean, I guess like a lot of body language um, just across the board. I mean, are there certain, like, do you have a lot of prospects that you go and see and you're like, man, they handled that, you know, the coach got on them, they handled it wrong. They slammed their body down back in the seat. Like, I mean, what are common things that you see that you're just, I mean, it's just like a turnoff. Well, for an NCAA kid, what you're looking at is the amount of travel that they've gone through already Mm -hmm. at the time of year. So if a kid, for example, if you went to go scout a a player, let's say up at Washington state in Pullman and, you know, from Arizona to get there would be quite the journey. Right. It's going to be temperature. It's going to be no direct flights. There's going to be some connecting and it's going to take a long time to get there. And so you're, you're looking at, you're, you're trying to take into consideration all those things because it's not just, it's not just flying to the game and playing. There's all these other things that can happen. Um, you know, the hotel isn't going to be the best in that city. Mm-hmm. So a lot of little factors like that. Plus it's what could be 50 degrees, 60 degrees, just change in temperature. So and vice versa, all, all, all within the league, you know? So you're, you're also looking at as much as it's explained, it's about, food and how the players eat and how they're handling classroom stress because even though they're on the road they still have their academic requirements right and they're still required to eat well even though some of them don't are you able to observe some of that stuff like as a scout like what's your uh like what are you allowed to do is it strictly games or can you be around in the locker room or like when they're eating or like what's kind of like your limits as a yeah scout? each each team will give a different parameter so it's much better if you have a relationship already prior with the coaching staff mm-hmm. and they'll have a trust based on practice is usually the best place oh yeah because it's uh there's no camera <laughs> there's none of that going yeah. on you get to see true true paying attention to detail or lack of, um, and the spirit. And focus. Yeah. And the spirit, the spirit of, of, of right. being ready for that game or if they're not. And I'm not sure, but if you truly pay attention to like the analysts that do the color commentating, they, they get that same access, uh, shoot at what's called shoot arounds and at practice. And every once in a while, they'll tell you the insight of like, I was at shoot around this morning and boy, Jimmy was, was so ready for this game, you know, and they tell you maybe some short snippets that they really recalled. And every once in a while, someone will also tell you something about that. They saw that wasn't, wasn't so great either. Mm-hmm. And, um, and that's the insight that you're gain that you're gaining, but you take into consideration, like let's say the PAC 12, that's enormous amount of travel to go from Southern California. Let's say, like I said, to, to Pullman, Washington, whereas in the ACC, boy, you know, hey, Duke can play North Carolina State and go home and Virginia and go home and they're back and forth that same day. Right. And that's totally different (laughs) (laughs) experience of being, you know, waking up in your own bed and going to class the next day. Um, So there are some factors like that. And again, like I said, the road plays a huge, huge, huge part in, in the growth in the time of year for all of these athletes. So as a scout, you definitely want to see them when you, if you can, the best is to see them in a practice setting. Right. And as far as like, like you were saying, it's important to see them like 
after they've been on the road and stuff, because I mean, as an NBA player, like that's your life. Like <laughs> you're playing, you know, different cities, like multiple days in the row in a row. And like, that's exhausting. And if you can't handle it emotionally, like as a college student, like that's nothing compared to the schedule they're going to have in the NBA. Yeah. Nothing like it. And, and what have you seen in the NBA? You see a, a significant amount of rookies doing some of them doing well, a lot of them not doing well. I mean, uh, boy, you haven't heard from Markel Fultz at all, you know, and, and that was the number one kid and been several of them like that, that you don't hear from them anymore. And right. something happened. They weren't either weren't prepared maturity wise, but you, you know, that's part of the NBA's uh, deal now is they're taking 19 year olds, hoping that, by the time they're 21, 22, that their value is skyrocketing and they've instantly come in and helped. That league is very young. It never used to be this young. Yeah. And uh, so. How, how soon do you think it's going to switch from, from the one and done role being like, how long do you think the NCAA is going to keep that? Cause I mean, it can't be, I feel like they can't keep it up forever. I don't, I don't think they can either, but it's, um, it's such a conversation that would probably take, you know, another, another segment to even discuss because that, that topic has been covered numerous times by how, how do you get a kid to come in and you know, you're going to get them for one year. It's really one semester. The second semester right. is just enrolled in classes, but he's not going to them. Yeah. And it's hard. Cause like, I mean, if you're a star athlete, I mean, to be honest, I would say 90% of like star, star athletes are probably not even going to class first semester. Um, and I know that's probably, yeah. you can't probably say that officially, but I mean, that's happening. Sure. Um, but it's just like, I mean, I guess it is just straight financial. I mean, if the university are losing out on some of these top players and then they're not getting attendance and like, I mean, I get it, but it's like, I don't see how it could be sustainable. It's uh, yeah, it's a, I don't see how it can be either, but I'm sure it, it's going to take that collaboration between the NCAA and NBA to, to fix that, right. to resolve that issue. Because that, that 19 year old rule is set in stone. And uh, there are, there are players that have proven that they can survive without going to college. Mm -hmm. uh, but there are others that have proven that that has, that's been devastating. That's so, true. That's true. And sorry, just, well, we got off topic again, but, uh, but I still That's think okay. it's, it's super interesting, but um, yeah. So like, let's kind of jump into like what you're working on right now and stuff that's going to be happening in the future. So um, I know you're doing, uh, I know you have uh, orange County magic organization. So if you want to like, just kind of yeah. tell everybody what that's all about and just give a full explanation on what that is. Yeah. So several years ago, um, well, you know, we, my family and I, we returned back in 2011 after being uh, overseas in the kingdom of Bahrain is where we were. And we came back and relocated in Southern California. And a couple of years after that, I decided, you know, maybe I would give it a shot to build an organization, a basketball academy. And so called it Orange County Magic. And it was based off of a, a, of a great friend of mine, Anthony Ray, who runs the Arizona Magic organization. And, um, and I loved how he ran his organization, but I, I had a caveat. I wanted this to be a teaching academy, not just straight, uh, playing basketball games and traveling that, that was not what I saw as the end result here. And, uh, so, you know, we, we, we started out really small and we've grown, uh, in, in immensely. And it's been wonderful to see because, you know, on, almost six days a week, there's some sort of teaching of basketball that's going on from kindergarten all the way to our high school players. And even my college and professional athletes, when they're not in, not with their respective teams come in and do the exact same, same training or, or help. And so it's, a, it's, it's wonderful to see a full cycle like that. Are there leagues as well, or is it strictly training? Yeah, we run our own. We, we decided, you know, I, Ran, a, ran this company kind of like a startup. You know, we just throw out ideas and I see what sticks and who knows. And so we, we decided one time, we're like, let's just run our own internal rec league and, and give our kids that aren't really 
100% sure about playing travel basketball, an opportunity to put on a uniform, have referees, be coached by our own coaches, have their, their parents sit in the attendance and, and play. And because many schools don't, don't offer that anymore. They don't, you can't, many schools don't have uh, school sports anymore. And so that was, it worked out for us. It's been a, it's been a wonderful blessing to see them because they play, you know, they'll have a uniform. We give them a team name, break them down into their respective leagues. And, you know, Arizona will be playing Stanford and it's their respective colors. And, and, and if they want to, after that, that experience, if they want to continue and they want to go on and play now travel basketball and go a little bit further and, and up then they can and but they're already used to it and um but if not we have, we have clinics available where they're learning learning things on a daily basis that's awesome no that that's amazing and i, I know like you, did you have another project going on as well i think i saw where you're working on a book yeah yeah so hopefully this year i actually can complete this book and get it all get it all done and 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 finish it i'm sure the publishers by now telling me on a, on a consistent basis, we kind of need to move on to the next phases. So <laughs> it's a process. So, yeah. Editing is, is, is one of those things where it's now in the final stages of that and moving awesome. on to the next, the uh, next things. And essentially it's about pursuing your passion. You know, I just, I, I see kids and players and students, for example, um, you know, when they're young, they're told you could be anything. And uh, then when they're, 18, 21 years old and going to graduate from high school or college, you know, what are you going to do next? You know, what are you going to do with that? How, what major is that? You know, how are you going to make money? You know, so there is a way to, for all of them to pursue their passion. They just have some roadblocks along the way. They may have to do other things along the way, but that doesn't mean that they can't pursue their passion. So the book is a little bit about my journey about some of that and, uh, and, and some of the secrets along the way of how, how to, how to remove some of those obstacles that will come along your way and don't lose sight of, of whatever it is you want to pursue. That's awesome. No, I can't wait to check it out. You have to, well, I'm sure you'll be posting about it on social media as you get closer to releasing it. Sure. So yeah, as soon as absolutely. it comes out, I'll, I'll put it out on my page too and, and promote it on my end as well. And uh, excited to check it out. Fantastic. I, I can't thank you enough for that. That's wonderful. Yeah. And just, uh, John, what is the best way for people to follow you on social media? That way they can keep up with everything that you're doing and, and whenever you do release your book. Yeah. Well, I have everything, you know, that you can follow me on, uh, you know, I have a, uh, my own webpage is my first and last name at dot com. And, um, I'm on Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, you name it. I pretty much have all of it and even Twitter. So it's, it's all there. Awesome. Yeah. I'll put all of those in the show notes. That way people can just click and follow you. And then John, just closing question that I ask every guest, but if you just had one piece of advice for the audience, maybe it's been, you know, your biggest takeaway through this whole journey, but if you just had one piece of advice to give, what would it be? Uh, find something that you, that you really love and love doing and try to be the best at it. I mean, there's, there's now a multitude of different things. You know, when I played basketball, my thing was, is like, I wasn't going to be the best defender. I wasn't going to be a whole lot of other things. I could be good at all of them. I wanted to be the best I could be at putting the ball in the basket. And that allowed me to focus on one thing at a time. Uh, I think that's a, that's a message that I still need to follow right now because there's many things that come along each, each person's daily life. And, um, I think if we can kind of concentrate on one thing at a time, it makes, mm -hmm. makes life a whole lot better. Definitely. No, I love that, John. And John, thank you just so much for taking time to come on. I loved having you. And I'm just excited just to watch everything that you do. Well, it's been fantastic. Thank you very much. Thank you guys so much for tuning into today's episode. I hope you loved my conversation with John. He's doing such positive work. And I'm excited for you guys to follow him on social media to keep up with everything that he's doing. You can find the social media links that we talked about in the episode in the show notes, but you can also find them on my website as well at drcaseyjohnson.com. That's D-R-K-A-S-E-Y johnson.com. Click on the Listen tab. 
Then from there, you'll be able to see all of the past guests that have come on the Unlock Wellness podcast, read a little bit about each guest, and be able to click on their social media links, websites, all of that. So all of John's information can be found on my site as well. If you guys loved today's episode with John, be sure to jump onto iTunes, subscribe, and write a review. It really helps me out a lot, and I really appreciate all of the feedback and support. And like I spoke about in the intro, also be sure to check out my first children's book of my Healthy Children's Book series called Maddox's Trip to the Chiropractor. Each purchase of the book supports the Unlock Wellness Project, which applies a wellness bag to a child in need for each book purchased. You can learn more about the book and the Unlock Wellness Project on my website as well at drcaseyjohnson.com. Click on the shop tab, then choose the children's book option. You'll be able to read a short description and even watch a short video to learn more. If you do purchase the book, be sure to share it on social media using the hashtag UWProject. I'll repost it and give you a shout out on the podcast. But I hope you guys love the book. Thank you guys so much for the support, and I hope you love today's episode. Thank you so much for tuning in. 